Thank you, Mr. Bode, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure I'm not giving away any secrets when I say that the past two and a half months was something that no one has ever experienced at the Volkswagen Group. That holds true for all of us, the supervisory board, the board of management, and the employees. No one here could have imagined that our company, a company where so many people give their best day after day, a company that is a source of pride to so many here in Wolfsburg and at the sites all over the world, could end up in a situation like the one we've been experiencing since the end of September. We're all not only deeply shocked by the events surrounding the emissions issue, but these events have also put the group in a very difficult situation. Mr. Müller and I would like to update you today on where we stand with regard to overcoming this crisis, what steps we have already taken, and how the Volkswagen Group is driving its renewal forward. Ladies and gentlemen, Volkswagen relies on the trust of its customers. Our customers not only expect to travel from A to B safely, comfortably and efficiently in one of our vehicles, they also, quite rightly, expect that the emissions produced by the vehicle on their journey do not exceed the thresholds set. And as it turned out, that has not always been the case for our vehicles. We deeply regret this. And I'm not only speaking on behalf of Mr. Müller and myself, but also in, on behalf of the entire company. As a result, we have lost trust, the trust of our customers, investors and employees, as well as the trust of politicians and the public. Our most important task and our biggest challenge now is to win back that trust. That is why we must continue to act with credibility and determination so that we can deal rigorously with the mistakes of the past and make sure something like this never happens again. We owe that, not least to our customers. At the same time, we must protect our operational business and defend our strong market position. Now, given the circumstances, that is not an easy task. But we are optimistic we can make it with our team. And in all these efforts, we must also safeguard the group's future success. On the one hand, in financial terms, because the fallout from the crisis will probably be considerable. And on the other, we must systematically continue with the ongoing change process to prepare Volkswagen for the upheavals faced by our industry. In a nutshell, and this much is certain, we are in the midst of one of the greatest tests in the history of the group. It will take an enormous effort on the part of everyone to pass this test, and we are all ready to play our part. It goes without saying that the supervisory board at times like these is supporting the board of management even more closely in its work. Moreover, the supervisory board has undertaken many initiatives of its own in recent weeks to take the process of clarification and realignment within the Volkswagen Group swiftly forward. First of all, I would like to mention the new management structure, which we signed off on September 25th. The Volkswagen Group will be decentralized to a greater extent in future. It will be more efficient, faster and more dynamic so that the group will be able to leverage its enormous potential potential even more effectively. We've also speeded up staff reorganization in the group. Without this realignment, the changes we envisage would not work properly. 
We have not only recruited new, renowned experts from outside the company, but also have also given some of the best minds from within our group new responsibilities. There are six new members in the Board of Management since early 2015. That shows how thorough this new realignment is. In addition, there are new top positions, Mr. Müller, We'll give you the details later on. In addition, the supervisory board has engaged to a greater degree in dialogue with our stakeholders. Now, in particular, we need support and goodwill from outside our company just as urgently as we need the commitment of all those in a position of responsibility within the group. We are soliciting support wherever possible. Ladies and gentlemen, what's important is that the Volkswagen Group is fully able to act in these very turbulent times. This company has a very solid foundation and many strengths that we can build on for the future. How and when we rise to those challenges is primarily, but not entirely, up to us. This also applies to the way we approach the clarification of the emissions issue. We want and indeed we must understand exactly how this could happen. That is the only way we can prevent anything like this from ever happening again. We have made a good deal of progress in this regard in recent weeks, and I would like to bring you up to date on what we have achieved so far. Allow me to recap. We are dealing with two very different issues. The first concerns up to 11 million of our diesel vehicles, which are fitted with a software program that systematically influenced the measurement of nitrogen oxide emissions. The second issue of recent weeks relates to CO2 emissions and the associated fuel consumption levels. During the critical review of our processes as a result of the NOx issue, Information from an internal source drew attention to implausibilities in CO2 certification. This was immediately and proactively communicated on November 3rd. At that time, we announced that around 800,000 vehicles could possibly be affected. We were concerned that the certification of these vehicles may have been deliberately based on incorrect emission data. Since then, as we announced yesterday, it became apparent that this assumption was wrong. The suspicion of unlawful changes in fuel consumption data for current production vehicles has not been confirmed. Slight deviations were only found for a very small number of models which will now be adjusted in the course of normal processes. That is good news for our customers and for the company. I will come back to this point in more detail in a few moments. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a clearly defined approach and goal for clarifying all aspects. Everything must be put on the table and nothing will be swept under the carpet. That means there must be a comprehensive analysis of what happened. So all the relevant processes from the source to the present day must be fully traced and analyzed. It is essential that these investigations are absolutely independent. That applies to the internal specialists we have entrusted with this task. Their mission is to investigate in all directions, regardless of personal reputation and with no taboos. Obviously, the same applies to the external specialists we have retained. In all our efforts, we are cooperating fully with the relevant authorities. We have repeatedly emphasized, and I am doing so again today, that we are relentlessly searching for those responsible for what happened. And you may rest assured that we will bring these persons to account. 
It is precisely because we are dealing with people and because exhaustive clarification is so important for the future of the company that diligence is absolutely imperative. Even though it is sometimes difficult for you and for us to remain patient, diligence takes precedence over speed. We are looking for definitive answers to the following questions. Exactly what happened and when? We must trace the processes and the decision-making paths. Were regulations or laws broken? And if so, which ones? To what extent did our internal processes encourage possible infringements? We expect this to give us an insight above all into where we need to make improvements. Who is responsible for the misconduct? This is not only about direct responsibility, but also about overall responsibility. And finally, how do we make sure that nothing like this ever happens again in the Volkswagen Group? Looking to the future, that is definitely the most important question. We have structured the clarification process in such a way that we can provide a reliable answer to each of these questions. As you're aware, the work on clarifying these issues is being monitored by a supervisory board special committee chaired by Dr. Wolfgang Porsche. Since uh, it was inaugurated on October 27th, the committee has met five times, so it closely follows the work of the investigators. There are two parallel threads to the investigations themselves. As mandated by the Supervisory Board and the Board of Management, internal auditing is focusing on examining the relevant processes on reporting and control systems and on the accompanying infrastructure. Internal auditing is making its entire findings available to the experts at Jones Day. This internationally renowned law firm commissioned In total, some 450 internal and external experts are involved in the investigations. The sheer number is an indication that we are taking this very seriously and are seeking conclusive results as quickly as possible. Both teams of investigators are working independently of each other. That is fundamental to objective clarification, something we as a company are very keen to achieve even if some of the findings could prove painful. To ensure that internal auditing operates independently and is fully functional, we have brought together the best experts from various units and brands within the group and formed a task force with a predefined clear mission of a specific duration. When their work is completed, the members of the task force will return to their usual duties. Incidentally, it also applies for the head of this mission, Markus Ebel, from Porsche AG, who has been assigned to Volkswagen for the duration of this mission. In this way, we can ensure that no personal interdependencies or misguided considerations obstruct clarification or distort the findings. Incidentally, a representative of Jones Day is also a member of the internal task force, a further guarantee for the independence of that task force investigations. All in all, we believe the dual structure of the investigations guarantees maximum objectivity, transparency and quality of results. There are two different scopes to the internal and external investigations. That is why the amount of time they need for their work differs. The analysis of the relevant processes and systems conducted by internal auditing will be concluded soon. The work being undertaken by Jones Day, on the other hand, will continue well into next year. 
That is, as we will explain in a moment, partly due to the fact that the external investigators have to sift through a gigantic volume of data. It is also explained by the fact that we also need to clarify who is legally responsible for what happened. So this investigation must not only be plausible and consistent, it must also stand up to scrutiny in court. We plan to report on the status of the investigation at the annual general meeting on April 21st, 2016. But we would like to give you some initial information today and share the findings made so far with you. Before we do that, though, I trust you will understand that we cannot and will not be commenting on the people involved. We can only do that once the findings are absolutely watertight, until such time, these people will be innocent until proven guilty. After all, we live in a state of law. In principle, what may be called the essence of what we have found out so far is that the NOx issue is the result of the interaction of three factors. First, individual misconduct and personal failures on the part of individual employees in one area of our company. A factor that can at best be contained, but can never be entirely eliminated in a group the size of Volkswagen. Second, flaws in some of our own processes. And third, an attitude in some units of the company that tolerated breaches of rules. That is apparently what happened in this case. And I freely admit that is the factor we all find the most difficult to accept. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to make one comment before I look at the findings of the internal audit in more detail. We widened the scope of the investigation in addition to the NOx issue once we found indications of irregularities in the CO2 certification process. Now that the CO2 issue has largely been concluded, we can once again concentrate fully on the nitrogen oxide issue. The areas investigated by internal auditing can be roughly divided into three clusters. First, processes, second, reporting and control systems, and third, infrastructure. The objective when analyzing the processes was to establish the exact sequence of events, or, in other words, to answer the question, what happened when. Today, we know that procedural problems encouraged misconduct. This applies, for example, to the test and approval processes for our engine control units. They were not suitable for preventing the use of the software in question. Internal audit has proposed specific remedial measures to remove these flaws. They focus on structuring processes more clearly and systemizing them better. For example, in future, the belt and braces principle will be strictly applied to the development of engine control units. At the same time, the committee is responsible for the approval of such software will be reorganized with stricter and binding competencies and responsibilities. Even though we cannot prevent misconduct on the part of individual employees once and for all, in future it will be very difficult to bypass our processes. The second area involves exposing deficits in reporting and control systems and identifying breaches of existing rules. Here, too, there were undoubtedly shortcomings. This was mainly due to the lack of a concrete definition of responsibilities. Here, we must and will tighten things up. The internal audit also uncovered shortcomings at some points in our infrastructure. For instance, some of our IT systems 
are inadequate. Obviously, an infrastructure that does not serve its purpose is not particularly useful. Going forward, we will be installing IT-supported processing and control systems in the relevant areas that interact seamlessly with our workflows. We'll be introducing IT systems that make it possible to track individual events more efficiently and with greater transparency. At the same time, that reduces dependence on individual persons when identifying and possibly escalating problematic events. That means we should be better equipped to identify malfunctions in good time and nip negative developments in the bud. To sum up, the investigation by the Internal Audit Department delivered valuable findings for us to create a framework at Volkswagen where breaches of rules like those we found in one area of the group are not encouraged but prevented or at least recognized early on. Ladies and gentlemen, as I already mentioned, the external investigators from Jones Day are also making good progress, but still need more time. In order to arrive at meaningful conclusions on accountability, they have to systematically plow their way through enormous volumes of data. That includes, for instance, innumerable emails, each one on its own, is just a loose end in the chain of communication where the context first has to be established. So you can imagine how fragmented and complex this forensic work is. Now, to illustrate my point, here are some figures. So far, the specialists have sorted through 102 terabytes of data. That is the equivalent of roughly 50 million books. 87 extensive interviews have been conducted to date in order to obtain the necessary information, and many more will follow. More than 1,500 electronic storage mediums, such as smartphones and laptops, have been secured from almost 400 employees. Around 2,000 group employees were informed in writing that they have to make sure that they do not lose any data. The English term is litigation hold. Now, I'm not saying that all of these people are under suspicion. What it means is that on their computers, SIM cards, or USB sticks, there could be information that might be important for understanding the circumstances better. We still believe that only a comparatively small number of employees was actually actively involved in the manipulations. What we have learned from the material that has been reviewed so far is first, we have a better understanding of the CO2 issue and how to achieve a swift solution, and second, we are better able to understand the origins and genesis of the NOx issue. The next two charts present the NOx issue in greater detail, beginning with the strategic decision to launch a major diesel campaign in the USA. I would simply like to give you a brief summary. The key finding is that we are not talking about a one-off mistake but the whole chain of mistakes that was not interrupted at any point along the timeline. Looking back, we regrettably have to recognize that the developers involved in the EA189 project quite simply could not find a way to meet the tougher NOx limits in the United States by permissible means or at least they could not find a way they felt at the time to be meaningful and that fitted the time frame and the budget they had been given. So a software was installed that regulated nitrogen oxide emissions by various means, such as adjusting exhaust gas recirculation levels depending on whether the vehicle was on the road or on a test bench. 
im weiteren Verlauf. Later down the line, when effective technical solutions to reduce NOx became available, these solutions were not in fact used as they should have been done, apparently in the mistaken interest of customers. Once again, the engine management software delivered the supposed solution. The software features included the ability to vary the add blue dosage level. As a result, NOx levels on the test bench were particularly low, but they were significantly higher on the road. With hindsight, this all sounds almost a little banal, but that is perhaps why we find the whole thing so painful, not because the decisions were wrong, but also the premises and the priorities on which they were founded. All this goes against the values of Volkswagen and the values by which the vast majority of our 600,000 employees act day in, day out. There are always occasions when there is not an immediate, perfect technical solution to a problem. That is when you have to keep working on the problem, take a frank and open look at conflicting interests, discuss alternatives, and possibly even totally rethink. What's definitely unacceptable is a superficial or even an illegal solution. No business can justify transgressing legal or ethical boundaries. Every single employee at Volkswagen must embrace that creed. We still do not know whether the people who've been involved in this issue from 2005 to the present day were fully aware of the risks they were taking and of the potential damage they could expose the company to. But that's something else we're going to find out. Ladies and gentlemen, apart from the smaller diesel engine, the V6 developed by Audi has also come in for scrutiny in the United States. There is, however, one fundamental difference. The crux of the problem for the Volkswagen EA189 engine is that the vehicle had two different exhaust strategies, one for the road and another one for the test bench. Now, that is not the case for Audi's V6 engine. Based on the same operating conditions, the warm-up strategy and the operating strategy are identical, regardless of whether the vehicle is on the road or on a test bench. The so-called AECDs, which stands for Auxiliary Emission Control Device, in the V6 engine that have come in for criticism in the United States, are not currently subject to registration in Europe. However, under valid US legislation, one of these devices could be considered to constitute a forbidden device. Audi will be presenting a technical solution to carbon EPA and implementing this solution as swiftly as possible once it has been approved. Exactly when this will be the case has yet to be finalized. And I would like to point out that we're talking about some 100,000 units, so the scale is significantly more manageable than the scale of the original diesel issue. The situation with regard to the CO2 issue is entirely different yet again as regards both the origin and the solution. As I already mentioned, based on the information we had, it appeared that a total of some 800,000 vehicles from various brands and models could have been affected by deliberate incorrect CO2 measurements. We immediately began systematic testing of the models that might possibly be affected. We also reviewed the measures and standards applied during testing. Our findings, first, the suspicion that the fuel consumption figures of current production vehicles had been unlawfully changed was not confirmed. Second, Volkswagen's measurement procedure conforms to the industry standard and 
is based and guided by the relevant international standards. And third, the remeasurements established that the actual consumption values for almost all of the current production vehicles are in fact in line with the catalogue figures and correspond to the original CO2 and fuel consumption figures respectively. The measurement checks only established slight deviations from the catalogue figures amounting to a few grams for nine vehicle models. For these model variants, the marke Volkswagen läuft nun eine unabhängige Überprüfung durch die DECRA. DECRA was commissioned by the industry regulator KBA as a technical service provider to perform an independent review for these Volkswagen brand model variants. With an annual production of approximately 36,000 vehicles, these model variants correspond to around only 0.5% of the Volkswagen brand's annual production volume. Based on the findings of this official remeasurement, the CO2 and fuel consumption data will be updated, if necessary, at the earliest possible opportunity in line with the usual processes. It's important to bear in mind that the estimated 2 billion euro negative impact on earnings initially attributed to the CO2 issue has not been confirmed. That is good news for the Volkswagen Group. We know that the CO2 issue has been a cause of considerable concern for many of our customers. So the latest developments are very good news for them. As things stand at the moment, any impact on tax seems unlikely. And if back taxes should be levelled, levied, Volkswagen has already given an undertaking to pay them. Ladies and gentlemen, tracking processes, identifying mistakes and establishing who is responsible, that is only part of the exercise. The other, much more important part, looks towards the future. Drawing the right conclusions from past mistakes and taking all the measures necessary to prevent something like this from ever happening again. We have already begun to put this part into practice too. Let me begin with the most important of these landmark decisions for Volkswagen. We have decided that our emissions tests will in future be verified by external and independent third parties. We will also be introducing universal on-road emissions measurements during real-life driving. We hope that will help us to win back trust. I would like to make one comment at this point. When it comes to thresholds, we need the courage to be more honest. The growing industry-wide discrepancies between official emissions data and real-life levels are no longer acceptable. We need to break new ground here. Implementation of more measures out of the 30 or so measures identified by internal auditing is already underway. All the findings from the internal audit will be submitted to Jones Day and therefore help clarify who is responsible. And finally, as far as responsibility is concerned, the first step was to suspend nine managers possibly involved in the manipulations. I do not intend to speculate on whether there will be further personnel consequences and if so, what they could be. But I can guarantee that we will take this relentless clarification to its final conclusion. This is the foundation for the renewal of the Volkswagen Group, which has already begun. I am committed to this. The entire supervisory board of Volkswagen AG is committed to this. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Matthias Müller.